When we first meet her, I think you would describe her as kind of on the periphery of things. She always seemed to me like an observer and a reader and a, a smart and intelligent girl. Maybe a little catty, a little bitchy. I suppose you didn't want him when he wanted you. And now it's the other way around. You have to admit, it's quite funny. It came from being slightly overlooked in favour of Mary. I was very taken by what you were saying over dinner. I'm so right there, Mary. How clever you are. This is exactly what we have to be aware of. Everyone in London is aware. They're not afraid to say the worst thing they could possibly think of to the other. He had a right to know how his countrymen died. In the arms of a slut. Their battle is always about how happy the other one is. So he slipped the hook. At least I'm not fishing with no bait. I think it always comes out of a place of jealousy from one another. They can't bear to see the other one succeeding when they are failing. Spare me your boasting, please. No, he's jealous. Jealous? Do you think I couldn't have that old booby if I wanted him? Even you can't take every prize. Is that a challenge? I think Edith matures out of that a bit, but Mary certainly continues to always try and bring Edith down when she herself is unhappy. Sir Anthony was a suitor for Edith that would have been a very simple match. Of all of them, Anthony Strallon is the most traditional choice. Robert, Edith is beginning her life as an old man's drudge. I should not have thought a large drawing room much compensation. He's interested in her, is very sweet and takes her out. He had a kind of place in society and she would have been the lady of the manor and it would have been all of the things that she'd expected for her life. All of us married. All of us happy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, my sweet one. He decides at the altar that he can't go through with it. Dearly beloved, we are gathered... I can't do this. What? I can't do it. Is devastating and so humiliating, I think, for Edith, and I think really is, yeah, so traumatising. Edith, I can't let you throw away your life like this. <laughs> what do you mean? We're so happy, aren't we? We're going to be so... Terribly, terribly happy. But you are going to be happy. I pray that you are. But only if you don't waste yourself on me. <laughs> She's sort of bold with it. Like, you know, we see the next day that she is not going to give up. Let me bring you up some breakfast. No. I'm a useful spinster. Good at helping out. That is my role. And spinsters get up for breakfast. You look very pretty today. I'm not sure how uh, professional it is of me to point that out. Gregson, I mean, he arrives as this um, sophisticated editor and someone who's interested in Edith's brain and her writing, and that's very attractive. Now, I've uh, read your piece. Now, of course, the plight of ex-soldiers is not an obvious topic for a woman's column. I know it isn't very feminine, but I felt so strongly about it, I thought it was worth a try. No, no, you, you misunderstand me. I like the idea of a woman taking a position on a man's subject. And I was going to say, don't be afraid of being serious when it feels right. We see them at a party where lots of the sort of Bloomsbury group type characters would all be hanging. And I think that's very exciting for Edith. Have you had any more time to think about what I said? 
You mean our living in sin? We'd only live in sin, as you call it, until the divorce. Don't you want to be with me? You know I do. More than anything. My um, incredible beaded dress that I wore in the Criterion, it's a moment in the story that you see Edith sort of become a woman. She is apart from her family and she's meeting a married man. You look very glamorous. I thought I'd make a bit of an effort. Glad you did. She knows he's married, but she's going to go for dinner with him on her own in London anyway. It feels so wild to be out with a man, drinking and dining in a smart London restaurant. It's a real moment where she embraces that side of herself. Can I kiss you? Not here. For all these people. I don't care. Kiss me. Now. Rosamond catches Edith coming back very early in the morning um, from Gregson's flat. So she uh, is sort of in her hands, really. Aren't you going to tell me what kept you out until six in the morning? Well, we... <laughs> and she ends up trusting Rosamond with the entirety of her secret. You're a grown woman, and I'm not a spy. But you're gambling with your future, my dear. Be under no illusions. Michael has gone to Germany and has ended up in a brawl with some brown shirts. He meets a, a sorry end there. I can be normal most of the time for weeks on end, but then I think I might never see him again and... I know. So she was alone again, um, in a far more dangerous scenario, this time with a, with a baby and a huge secret. I think I know how I can keep the baby. What? To keep her secret, Edith decides to have the baby in Switzerland. Edith feels that she can't leave Marigold in Switzerland, that she has to bring her closer to home. Um, and she gets the help of Mr. Drew, wonderful Mr. Drew, who feels indebted to the Crawley family for letting him stay at the farm. It has to be a complete secret from my family. I'll, uh... Send a letter to myself tonight and tell Margie it's about an old friend of mine who's died and has to know well for me to take the child. Then nobody but you and I will know. Mr. True, would you do that for me? For you and the little girl, my lady. Yes. They try different tactics of, of having her like a sort of goddaughter um, who's taking a special interest in Marigold. It's you, my lady. Yes, I wanted to bring my aunt to meet Marigold. But it just is too much. It's too much for the True family to cope with. Honestly, Tim, I can't manage it much longer. I'm sorry if she's lonely. I'm sorry she wants a child, but she can't have ours and that's flat. And for Edith. And in the end, she, she takes her away to London. Well, we're together, darling. And I know it's not ideal, but it's such an improvement on being apart that I think we should celebrate. I'll order ice cream and a glass of champagne and we'll be as jolly as you like. Yes. That scene really was so, so sad. Edith really wants to celebrate the fact that she has her daughter back in her life. But you see how incongruous that whole moment is of this woman actually alone in a very empty, sad room. Well, I have a different plan. I'd like you to bring her home. Bringing her back and having her at Danton. I think the thing with the Crawleys is that they are very accepting, as well as being very traditional. And you love her? Your new granddaughter? As a matter of fact, and perhaps to my surprise, I rather think I will.
I'm Bertie Pelham, the agent. Are you often asked to come when they're shooting? Uh, no, I'm not. But I'm staying for dinner, which they really didn't have to do. It's a really lovely start to their relationship, Bertie and Edith. He arrives at a time where she just, for the first time in years, feels sort of safe. It's not until we see him again in London that you see that he's been in her mind. Lady Edith Crawley. It is you, isn't it? Hello. Oh, Bertie Pelham. We met at Brancaster when it was let to Lord Cinderby. Of course. I'm sorry to be so dense. I remember you very well. I think he finds it all very exciting. She's not only a lady with a great social standing, but she is making something for herself. I'm so, so sorry, but believe me, if you knew what I'm living through, you'd forgive me. And that's when I think you see that Bertie is intrigued. My editor has walked out. I have to get the magazine to the printers by four in the morning, so it's sandwiches and coffee and work until dawn. All right. <laughs> oh, you're a darling, thank you. And do telephone me if and when you're up in London again. No, I meant, all right, I'll come with you. Oh, come with me where? Back to the office. I can make coffee, I can fetch sandwiches, I can carry bits of paper around. <laughs> the night that they work on the newspaper together, you see how she's taken it back with his confidence and his ease. What's the idea? At Lady Elton's costume ball. I can't decide which guests are the most important. Never mind that. Best clothes and prettiest faces. His ability to encourage and support Edith, I think, is very important. You inspire me. Not many people would say that. <laughs> they would if they knew you. Well, I better just say it. I want to marry you. Oh. After Bertie's proposal, an elevation to Marquis. Bertie Pelham is now the Marquis of Hexham? Yes. Mary is horrified. But that's absurd. If Bertie's a Marquis, then Edith... Edith would outrank us all, yes, that's right. <laughs> Mary can't cope with the idea that Edith could not only end up married, but married to a Marquis. It just seems too much. Golly gumdrops, what a turn-up! After everything, it turns out that Edith is the one who's going to get the perfect marriage. Not only with someone who she adores, but who is very powerful. And Mary decides to sabotage it. I'm very happy for you. And I admire you, Bertie. Not everyone would accept Edith's past. Mary, don't. What do you mean? Well, you must have told him. You couldn't accept him without telling him. Tell me what? About Marigold, who she really is. Marigold is my daughter. Will you excuse me? In our final series, we see the row we all knew was coming. I know you to be a nasty, jealous, scheming bitch. Now listen, you pathetic... You're a bitch! And not content with ruining your own life, you're determined to ruin mine. I have not ruined my life. And if Bertie's put off by that, then... Don't demean yourself by trying to justify your venom. Just go. But it's not over yet for Edith and Bertie. What on earth? How did you know I would be here? Are you leaving? I certainly am. Good night, darling. I'll telephone in the morning. Is this all a setup? Somebody tipped you off. I was in London. Was it Papa? It was Mary. Mary? But why did you do it? It was something Granny said. What a waste it would be for both of you. You're such a paradox. You make me miserable for years, and then you give me my life back. Look, we're blood, and we're stuck with it. So. Let's try and do a little better in future. And 
the sort of ultimate wedding, the biggest wedding dress, the, the biggest crowds um, were for Edith's wedding and I, it's been really lovely. I loved playing the wedding scene. It did feel like a very momentous day. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation Harry and I were giggling, we thought it was so funny, but everyone had this energy of excitement like it was a real wedding. Instituted of God in the time of man's innocency. It was the ultimate, yeah, happy ending. And it couldn't be more perfect.